Welcome, everybody, to another reading of Deleuze's book, Bergsonism. I am joined here with Cody Without Organs. I am Don't Even Dream About It. And we are moving on to Chapter 3, Memory as Virtual Coexistence. In the previous sections, we have learned about the two different types of false problems, the quantitative versus the qualitative multiplicity, as well as differences of degree versus differences in kind. And we're really excited to continue this Bergsonian journey. How are you feeling, Cody? Yeah, I'm feeling good. I enjoyed I enjoyed the last read. I can't say I, I fully understand chapter two. Um, so I, can't, I don't feel like I'm I'm as fully prepped as I could be, but you never can be for these things. Uh, the last one was duration as immediate datum. I, I don't really think I could exactly explicitly tell you what that meant, duration as, as, as uh, immediate datum. But I think as we get through each chapter, we'll probably get more and more layers, more and more context, more and more meat and substance to dive into that will allow us to flourish all of our previous readings and all of our previous interpretations. You know, Deleuze is like that. He, he leaves you a trail of breadcrumbs, right? And we are Hansel and Gretel. I'm ready to go. Yeah, I and I think just to kind of maybe pick up on like your question, if if I'm thinking of the um the memory or intuition as immediate datum, or was it memory or intuition as immediate immediate datum? Oh, duration as immediate datum. Yes. So I think one one way we can maybe start to clear this up is that Bergson saw two different multiplicities that diverge from the same original impetus, and you could think of the original impetus as a starting point or kind of an explosive starting point, kind of very really similar to like the, a Big Bang Theory kind of interpretation, but not exactly the same because it encompasses a metaphysical as well as a physical um, types of multiplicity. So one of them would be the differences in de uh, defined between the differences of degree and the other one would be differences in kind. So the differences in degree would be a mechanistic interpretation or a meta a physical extensive way of multiplicity and the differences in kind would be quanti qualitative and um, a matter of philosophy and metaphysics and the media datum bit i think what uh deleuze and bergson are trying to get at with us this idea is um a purely intentional or intensive way of interacting with the world where we have an immediate um, response or an immediate grasp of the movement of objects as opposed to objects in static sequential form. So like uh, cinema, right? It There's two ways of looking at like a movie. One way would be, well, it's just a bunch of repeating picture or a, a series of static pictures with sound overlaid, right? But how it's experienced is that flow of movement. So the media datum is the flow of movement, whereas the, the quantitative way of looking at it is it's a succession of static photos or images. I don't know if that helps clear it up a little bit, um, but do you? Does what? What are your thoughts so far? I think that's really good. Uh, we're teasing one of, for some reason the one some of the last few texts by Deleuze, his last few seminars and texts were on cinema, and they contain so much of his previous philosophy. Yeah, they're all about all about film. And but yeah, exactly the two books, and they are very Bergsonian. He refers to them as his very his very Bergsonian text. The first one, I believe, is called Movement Image. How Cinema takes uh, the extension of photographs and images to create a sense of movement. So this is kind of the logic of sense, of course. And then how they also create a sense of time, despite themselves not actually being, they are not moving as such, and they are not in time as such, but they come to represent a sense of time. And, uh, well, that's something that we need a lot of Bergson for. I like that. I think the way we could definitely read it, as you've been describing it, is duration as substance, as that metaphysical stuff that comes before 
form and expression, right? Form, matter, content, all of this stuff is derived from substance and it comes to represent the substance, but it isn't the substance itself. That's the Spinozan kick too. And duration, I think we read as the same thing. Duration is not what we experience as the form itself, because the form can be a difference in the degree or the difference in kind. But the duration as immediate data means that it's the very substance of the thing which we are perceiving, whether it be in whatever form it is, whatever shape it is, whatever matter it is. And then intuition, going all the way back to the first chapter, is being able to mark out this duration as substance, being able to separate the substance, the duration, from its form and matter, because form, matter, content, expression, all of these things are spatial. And Deleuze and Bergson are getting us to review every question we ask, to review every problem we have in terms of time rather than space, which requires us to perform a complete paradigm shift in our perception. I don't even think I can begin to imagine what that means to perceive in terms of time instead of space. But that's the whole point, right? That's the whole game we got to play. Um, would you like to start reading Chapter 3, Memory is Virtual Coexistence? Yeah, let's do it. Chapter 3, Memory as Virtual Coexistence. Duration is essentially memory, consciousness, and freedom. It is consciousness and freedom because it is primarily memory. Now Bergson always presents this ide identity of memory and duration in two ways. One, the conversion and preservation of the past and present, or else whether the present distinctly contains the ever-growing image of the past, or whether by its continual changing of quality attest to the increasingly heavy burden dragged along behind when the older one grows. Or again, memory in these two forms, covering as it does with a cloak of recollection of eternal move moments. In fact, we should express in two ways the manner in which duration is distinguished from a continuous series of instants repeated identically. On the other hand, the following moment always contains, over and above the preceding one, the memory the latter has left. On the other hand, the two moments contract or condense into each other since one has not yet disappeared when another appears. There are, therefore, two memories, two, or two indissoluble, indi <laughs> indissolubly <laughs> linked aspects of memory recollection memory and contraction memory if we ask what in the final analysis is the basis of this duality in duration doubtless we find ourselves in a movement which we shall examine later by which the present that endures divides at each instant into two directions one oriented and dilated toward the past the other contracted contracting towards the future. These are opposite movements. But pure duration is itself the result of a division that is only operative in principle. It is clear that memory is identical to duration, that it is coextensive with duration, but this proposition is valid in principle more than in fact. The special, mem the special problem of memory is how by what mechanism does duration become memory in fact? How does that which exists in principle actualize itself? In the same way, Bergson shows that consciousness is in principle coextensive with life. But how and under what conditions does life in fact become self-conscious? Any Crikey. Yeah, any bit we this is we're not very far in. Should we discuss or just keep going the next bit is quite short as well we are just being set up with questions and problems that will then take us through bergson's answers in matter and memory so this is a very matter and memory heavy um heavy chapter yeah let's let's see what Deleuze has picked out of bergson for us to answer these problems the problems of how can memory come to be like pure duration 
and how out of this do we find perception as something more than just conscious memory how do we get self-consciousness what a, what a crazy metaphysical ontological question let's go let's do it let us resume the analysis of the first chapter of matter and memory we are led to distinguish five senses or aspects of subjectivity one need subjectivity the moment of negation Need makes a hole in the continuity of things and holds back everything that interests it about the object, letting the rest go by. Two, brain subjectivity. The moment of interval or of indetermination, the brain gives us the means of choosing that which corresponds to our needs in the object, introducing an interval between received and executed movement. It is itself the choice between two ways because in itself, by virtue of its network of nerves, it divides up excitation infinitely, and also because in relation to the motor cells of the core, it leaves us to choose between several possible reactions. 3. Affection subjectivity. The moment of pain because affection is the price paid by the brain or by conscious perception. Perception does not reflect possible actions, nor does the brain bring about the interval without the assurance that certain organic parts are committed to the immobility of a purely repetitive role that surrenders them to pain. 4. Recollection subjectivity. The primary aspect of memory Recollection being what comes to fill the interval, being embodied or actualized in the properly cerebral interval. 5. Contraction subjectivity. The second aspect of memory, the body being no more a punctiform instant in time than a mathematical point in space, and bringing about a contraction of the experienced excitations from which is born. Now, these five aspects are not merely organized in order of increasing depth, but are distributed on two very different lines of facts. The first chapter of Matter and Memory sets out to decompose a composite representation in two divergent directions, matter and memory, perception and recollection, objective and subjective, of the two multiplicities of time and free will. Of the five aspects of subjectivity, the first two obviously belong to the objective line, since the first confines itself to abstracting from the object, and the second confines itself to establishing a zone of indetermination. The case of affection, the third sense, is more complex. It undoubtedly depends on the intersection of two lines, but the positivity of affection in its turn is not yet the presence of a pure subjectivity that would be opposed to pure objectivity. It is rather the impurity that disturbs the latter. The province of the pure line of subjectivity is thus the fourth and the fifth sense. Only two aspects of memory strictly signify subjectivity. The other meanings confine themselves to making way for or bringing about the insertion of one line into the other, the intersection of one line with the other. That's a lot. <laughs> All right. Oh my God. You, oh, this next bit. Oh, so um, this next bit is where we finally get this virtuality, the virtuality of Bergson um, and Deleuze's taking of this idea of the virtual in terms of uh, memory and most importantly in terms of subjectivity uh, this next bit's long this last bit this bit that you just read is, oh my goodness me five types of subjectivity right this will come in handy this will come in handy throughout the next bit goodness me <laughs> I, I, and how yeah sorry go 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 i was just gonna say sorry for cutting you off um no, no, that's fine. for the the five types of subjectivity um i like that it that deleuze says that uh, these are not like of increasing complexity, but rather they demonstrate um, kind of tendencies of the two diverging lines of 
what I think what Ber- what Bergson would say is of evolution, but um, also mm-hmm. of the articulation of matter and memory, um, and how these two different types of diverging lines have their own kind of separate qualities that make them what they are, um, but how they're they're pushing in opposite directions, so to speak, but in a parallel sort of function where they sometimes will meet, which is why there is that kind of complexity. And what Bergson will, will end up saying in creative evolution is that what kind of marks the human is how the human is kind of constantly bouncing back and forth between those two lines, which kind of leads to the complexity of what it means to be human um, is, is the, the bouncing back between the two lines of um, evolution, which is really interesting. No, I'm glad you said it. Um, the two movements, one of, I can't remember how they describe it. One is the contraction yeah. toward the future. And the other is, I think he says dilated, dilated toward the past. Um, the current, the main, uh, well, it's a social science, but the main scientific inquiry and method into memory would be cognitive psychology. And this is both a good thing and a bad thing. that They collapse uh, three different types of, of memory together. Um, the procedural, the semantic, and the episodic. With the procedural being what we could call the memory of the body itself, what you could call unconscious memory. Um, and then, of course, semantic has to do with our understanding of things, our basic knowledge, stuff like the sun exists and it rises. And then we have our episodic, which is how we construct ourselves how we construct the story and the narrative of who we are as an ego throughout our existence and throughout our perception um and that's a good thing that it collapses body mind and subjectivity altogether but it lacks what is what bergson and what Deleuze find very important here which is how memory itself constitutes subjectivity not how memory is just a part of it that's what psychology cognitive psychology does it views the mind as just like a computer model and with its, so you can examine it by its different parts. Memory is a part, um, function is a part, cognition is a part. But Henry Berg's song is taking apart memory itself as a composite, showing us all of its parts, and so that we can also do the same thing for subjectivity, decomposing how memory is a fundamental part of what makes up subjectivity, and not just in one way. It does it in an actual way, and also does it in a virtual way. It does it in ways that are... Goodness me. I mean, these five types of subjectivity, <laughs> it's only going to get more confusing. But yeah, um, this next bit, yeah, this next bit, I think will have some some fundamental answers for us in, in the very meaning of what is memory in terms of the virtual and how does this virtual affect and come to compose subjectivity on these two different lines from the past, from the pu- from the future, from the actual to the virtual and so on and so on. The question, where are recollections preserved? involves a false problem, that is to say, a badly analyzed composite. It is as though recollections had to be preserved somewhere, as though, for example, the brain were capable of preserving them. But the brain is wholly on the line of subject uh, of objectivity. There can be there cannot be any difference in kind between other states of matter and the brain. For in the latter, everything is movement, as the pure perception that it determines. And yet, the term movement obviously must not be understood in the sense of enduring movement, but on the contrary, as an instantaneous section. Recollection, on the contrary, is a part of the line of subjectivity. It is absurd to mix the two lines by conceiving of the brain as a reservoir or the substratum of recollections. Moreover, an examination of the second line would be sufficient to show that recollection, recollections do not have to be preserved anywhere other than in duration. Recollection, therefore, is preserved in itself. Only then did I become aware of the fact that inward experience in a pure state in giving us a substance whose very essence is to endure and consequently to prolong continually into the present and indestructible past would have relieved me from seeking and would have forbidden me to seek where recollections is preserved 
it preserves itself. Moreover, we have no interest in presupposing a preservation of the past elsewhere than in itself, for example, in the brain. The brain in its turn would have to the brain in its turn would need to have the power to preserve itself. We need to confer this power of preservation that we have denied to duration on a state of matter or even on the whole of matter. We are touching on one of the most profound, but perhaps also one of the least understood aspects of Bergsonism, the theory of memory. There must be a difference in kind between matter and memory, between perception and pure recollections, between the present and the past, as there is between the two lines previously distinguished. We have great difficulty in understanding a survival of the past in itself because we believe the past is no longer, that it ceases to be. We have thus confused being with present being present. Nevertheless, the present is not, rather it is a pure becoming, always outside itself. It is not, but it acts. Its proper element is not being, but the active or the useful. The past, on the other hand, has ceased to act or to be useful, but it has not ceased to be. Useless and inactive and passive, it is, in the full sense of the word. It is identical with being in itself. It should not be said that it was, since it is the thing in itself of being, and the form under which being is preserved in itself, in opposition to the present, the form under which being is consummated and places itself outside of itself. At the limit, the ordinary determinations are reversed. Of the present, we must say at every instant that it was, and of the past that it is, that it is eternally for all time. That is, this is the difference in kind between the past and the present. But this first aspect of the Bergsonian theory would lose all sense if its extra-psychological range were not emphasized. What Bergson calls pure recollection has no psychological existence. This is why it is called virtual, inactive, and unconscious. All these words are dangerous, in particular the word unconscious, which since Freud has become inseparable from an especially effective and active psychological existence. We will have occasion to compare the Freudian unconscious with the Bergsonian, since Bergson himself made the comparison. We must nevertheless be clear at the point that Bergson does not use the word unconscious to denote a psychological reality outside unconscious, sorry, outside consciousness, but to denote a non-psychological reality being as in it itself, being as it is in itself. Strictly speaking, the psychological is the present. Only the present is psychological, but the past is pure ontology. Pure recollection has only ontological significance. Now let us quote the admirable passage where Bergson summarizes the whole of his theory. When we look for recollection that escapes us, quote, we become conscious of an act su sui generisus. We become conscious of an act sui genesis. Replace ourselves, find in the past in general, then in a certain region of the past a work of adjustment, something like the focusing of a camera, but our recollection still remains virtual. We still prepare ourselves to receive it by adopting the appropriate attitude. Little by little, it comes into view like a condensing cloud. From the virtual state, it passes into the actual. Here again, we must avoid an overly psychological interpretation of the text. Bergson does not speak 
of the psychological act. But if this <laughs> is, um, it, but if this act is sui genesis, this is because it has made a genuine leap. We place ourselves at once in the past. We leap into the past as into a proper element. In the same way, we do not perceive things in ourselves, but at the place where they are, we only grasp the past at a place where it is in itself and not in ourselves in our present. There is therefore a past in general that is not particular that is not the particular past of a particular present, but that is like an ontological element, a past that is eternal and for all time, the condition of the passage of every particular present. In the past in general, that makes possible all pasts. According to Bergson, we first put ourselves back into the past in general. He describes in this way the leaping into ontology. We really leap into being, into being in itself, into the being in itself of the past. It is the case of leaving psychology altogether. It is a case of an immemorial or ontological memory. It is only then, once the leap has been made, that recollection will gradually take us on a psychological existence. From the virtual it places into the actual state, we have had to search at the place where it is, the impassive being, and gradually we have in an embodiment a psychologization. <laughs> the parallels between this text and some others must be emphasized, for Bergson analyzes language in the same way as memory. The way in which we understand what is said to us is identical to the way in which we find a recollection. Far from recomposing sense on the basis of sounds that are heard and associated images, we place ourselves at once into the elements of sense, then in a region of this element. A true leap into being it is, not, it is only then that sense is actualized in the psycholo sorry, it is only then that sense is actualized in the psychologically perceived sounds and in the images that are psychologically associated with sounds. Here then, here there is a kind of transcendence of sense and an ontological foundation of language that, as we shall see, are particularly important in the work of an author whose critique of language is considered to be uh, overly hasty. We must place ourselves at once in the past, in a leap, a jump. Here again, this almost Kierkegaardian idea of a leap is strange in the work of a philosopher who is confident, sorry, who is considered to be so attracted to continuity. What does this mean? Bergson constantly says, you will never recompose the past with presence, no matter what they may be. The image pure and simple will not take me back to the past unless indeed it was in the past that I sought it. The past, it is true, seems to be caught between two presents, the old present that it once was and the actual present in relation to which is now past. The false beliefs are derived from this. On the one hand, we believe that the past as such is, con is constituted after having being present. On the other hand, that it is in some way reconstituted by the new present whose past is now. This double illusion is at the heart of all psycholo psychological and um, physiological and psychological theories of memory. When one is influenced by such a illusion, one assumes that there is only a difference in degree between recollection and perception. We are thus entangled in a badly analyzed composite. This composite is the image. Uh, 
this composite is the image as psychological reality. The image, in effect, retains something of the regional where we have had to look for the recollection that is actualize, that actualizes or embodies. But it does not actualize this recollection without adapting it to the requirements of the present. It makes it into something of the present. Thus, we substitute the simple differences in degree between recollection image, images and perception images for the degrees in kind between present and the past, between pure perception and pure memory. We are too accustomed to thinking in terms of the present. We believe that a present is only past when it is replaced by another present. Nevertheless, let us stop and reflect for a moment. How would a new present come about if the old present did not pass at the same time that it is present? How would any present whatsoever pass if it were not passed at the same time as present? The past would never be constituted as if it had not been constituted, first of all, at the same time that it was present. There is here, as it were, a fundamental position of time and also the most profound paradox of memory. The past is contemporaneous with the present that it has been. If the past had to wait in order to be no longer, if it was not immediately and now that it had passed, passed in general, it could never have become what it is. It would never be that past. If it were not constituted immediately, neither could it be reconstituted on the basis of an ulterior present. The past would be constituted if it did not coexist with the present, whose past it is. The past and the present do not denote two successive moments, but two elements which coexist. One is the present, which does not cease to pass. The other is the past, which does not cease to be, but through which all present pass. It is in this sense that there is a pure past, a kind of past in general. The past does not follow the present, but on the contrary, it presupposed, is presupposed by it as a pure condition without which it would not pass. In other words, each present goes back itself as past. The only equivalent thesis is Plato's notion of re uh, reminiscence. The reminiscence also affirms a pure being of the past, the being in itself of the past, an ontological memory that is capable of seeing as a foundation for the unfolding of time. Yet again, a Platonic inspiration makes itself profoundly felt in Bergson. Holy shit. <laughs> oh, holy shit. I said a past like a billion times. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, tell me what you think first. Tell me, tell me say anything. Anything about what was just read. And um, I'll see what we can do, see what we can go from there. Okay. Um, what I think is going on with um, what Deleuze is saying is that, I guess, one language is unreliable in talking about the past, right? Because the, I think the reason why this gets so tricky to even articulate is because once we have already spoken on the past, it has already passed. <laughs> um, and that the present mm -hmm. is a continually like unfolding of the past. Like the, the past is always getting away from us through the present. Um, but if we're if we're looking at it mechanist mechanistically, right, like if we're only looking at it in terms of like, well, this is past, this is present, we're always going to be left in that kind of um, situation. But what I mm. think it's leading to, I, I think I might need to try to ground this in the text somewhere, but I don't know how yet. Um, what I think it's leading to is that we can only really think of it that time is flow, right? And um, but again, I think I think I'm just getting so like lost in saying the word past about like 30 times in one paragraph that I am <laughs> I'm struggling to actually follow the the train of thought. 
there's so many there's so many trains a real rhizome of four um yeah one language the language that we have and this is the kind of the whole spin here the language that we have to ground the past as such is a is a psychological language whereas this is an attempt at an ontological language but the whole beginning of this chapter it sounds exactly like what you read in phenomenology it sounds like what you would be reading if you were to read um, Martin Heidegger's Sein und Zeit, Being in Time, it's almost exactly the same, but it's got a, a little difference, a little Bergsonian difference to the Heideggerian one. Heidegger goes to talk about ontics, uh, das Sein, but Bergson doesn't do any of that. Um, and of course, Heidegger is a very influential figure for Deleuze too. He comes up a lot in what is grounding, but I think the whole point of reading Bergson and still doing a little bit of phenomenology is so that we don't have to do the Heidegger, so that we're not making the same... Uh, ontological distinctions as Heidegger. Yeah, the, the, we've said past about 30 times, <laughs> and this is necessary because we're realizing that the language that we have around it is a very, is a badly worded problem and also a false problem because there isn't just one collective past that we can refer to. There are, and I think what's being distinguished here is that we can say that there are two, but even this is a bad way of seeing it, right? Past in general, <laughs> the ontological past, the past that we can say has been already, that has mm. already been the case. And the past, which is contemporaneous, the past which yeah. exists alongside the present, which continues to affect us now. And this is the same as saying that there are two types of virtual pasts, and there is the present, which is the past actualized. And if you... Uh, and to explain that any further would to have would be to have to go back through this chapter and read the whole thing again, <laughs> <laughs> which would just take it just takes ages. But um, yeah, absolutely, virtuality. We're getting all sorts of stuff here. The, um, oh god, the do you, do you see the image on the next page? Yeah, we're we'll we'll probably have to break that down whenever we get to it, <laughs> and I, I think it will be broken yeah. down by the text yeah. too. But I I do see it, and I'm looking forward to it honestly it looks interesting you, you see yeah there's the past in general the so the continuous past but also the past that has been and i i think that this yeah. past as ontology is probably moving towards a critique because i don't really see deleuze moving towards an ontology of time um but instead mm -hmm. to kind of be more in favor of this continuous contemporaneous past with the present um yeah and i but absolutely but i i don't even know if it's just just a critique i think it's literally just like the two ways that we perceive time and um mm. the the time that we're more used to is the past that has already passed and we we see this we think of this most of the time like i think if we're saying oh well my, my grandma died we typically don't wouldn't say that like oh well my grandma died and that this death is contemporaneous with the present right like whenever we say a statement like that we mean oh well in this past that has already passed and yeah um but i think what deleuze and bergson are trying to i guess articulate is that there is a kind of past that is contemporaneous with our present and that is preserved through memory, um, but also that which endures from the past into the present. And <laughs> it's kind of a lot. I, I can't say that I have a perfect grasp on it and that I can articulate it, but I think yeah, we're moving towards it. Yeah, we have the sum of the parts, but we don't have the gestalt whole yet. We don't have that which is greater than the sum of its parts, but all the pieces, we've got all the pieces of the jigsaw, we are just struggling to make the whole picture, but definitely, absolutely, I think you're right. Deleuze is critiquing, yes, Bergson, but also at the same time um, making love to Bergson, as he says, <laughs> right, to create a new monstrous child. He doesn't just want to repeat Bergson, he wants to see what you can do with it. What happens if you want to read Bergson in this particular way? What happens if you want to read matter and memory through this distinction? One, ontologically grounded past, two, virtual contemporaneous past and then vice versa to not just see these as two split lines but to understand these as planes which intersect and create one another and this is how subjectivity 
emerges. And this is how you distinguish subjectivity as mm -hmm. not just a false problem to say, our oh, subjects emerge out of the past. And we have to go, well, okay, well, what kind of subjectivity are you describing? And what kind of past are you describing? Which just means that for every, every principle, for every axiom, just like in the ethics that we want to explain, it requires us to develop much, 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 much more. It creates for us more problems for every question we try to answer. And that's kind of the wonder of it. It's kind of the, the best thing about this whole any any Deleuzian text inspires in you much more problems. Every time you want to answer a question, and it's annoying because people always want to know what Deleuze is talking about, especially when we're reading him. But every time we begin to try and tautologically define what it is that's being said, we end up we end up stumbling. We end up falling over our own words. We end up repeating stuff, and we end up being like, well, I I know that I think I know it, and yet there's also something just something missing just that i can't grasp the whole thing and i can't i can't give it to you in a neat package with a neat bow but that's the whole point that's absolutely the whole point this isn't hamburger mcdonald's philosophy this is stuff that you're gonna have to chew and digest and, and let it sit in your stomach for another year before you can even think about working with it and using it um yes i'm ready to get moving on yeah give me a second sorry let's do it okay. the idea of a contemporaneity oh my goodness me contemporaneity of the present and the past has one final consequence not only does the past coexist with the present that has been but as it preserves itself in itself while the present passes it is the whole integral past it is all our past which coexists with each present the famous metaphor of the cone represents this complete state of coexistence. But such a state implies, finally, that in the past itself, there appear all kinds of levels of profundity, marking all the possible intervals in this coexistence. The past AB coexists with the present S, but by including itself in all the sections, A-B, A-B, etc., that measure the degrees of a purely ideal proximity or distance in relation to S. This doesn't make sense without the topology. We're referring to a, a, a topology or to a diagram <laughs> um, for the YouTube viewers. Hopefully they can see this, right? Indeed, they can. Each of, these, each of these sections is itself virtual, belonging to the being in itself of the past. Each of these sections or each of these levels includes not particular elements of the past, but always the totality of the past. It includes the totality at more or less expanded or contracted level. This is the precise point at which contraction memory fits in with recollection memory and in a way takes over from it. Hence this consequence. Bergsonian duration is, in the final analysis, defined less by succession than by coexistence. In time and free will, duration is really defined by succession. Coexistence is referring back to space and by the power of novelty, and repetition referring back to matter. But more profoundly, duration is only succession, relatively speaking, and we have seen in the same way that it is only indivisible, relatively. Duration is indeed real succession, but it is only so because, more profoundly, it is virtual coexistence. The coexistence with itself of all the levels, all the tensions, all the degrees of contraction and relaxation, they taunt. Thus, with coexistence, repetition must be reintroduced into duration. A psychic repetition of a completely different type than the physical repetition of matter. A repetition of planes rather than of elements on a single plane. Virtual instead of actual repetition. The whole of our past is played. It restarts, repeats itself at the same time on all the levels that it sketches out. Let us return to the leap that we make when, looking for a recollection, we place ourselves at once in the past. Bergson gives the following clarification. We place ourselves firstly into the past in general, then into a certain region of the past. 
it is not a case of one region containing particular elements of the past, particular recollections, in opposition to another region which contains other recollections. It is a case of there being distinct levels, each one of which contains the whole of our past, but in a more or less contracted state. It is in this sense that one can speak of the regions of being itself, the ontological regions of the past in general all coexisting, all repeating one another. Later, we shall see how this doctrine revives all the problems of Bergsonism. However, at this point, it is enough to summarize the four main propositions that form as many paradoxes. One, we place ourselves at once in a leap in the ontological element of the past. This is the paradox of the leap. Two, there is a difference in kind between the present and the past, the paradox of being. Three, the past does not follow the present that it has been, but coexists with it, the paradox of coexistence. And four, what coexists with each present is the whole of the past, integrally on various levels of contraction and relaxation, or detente. And this is the paradox of psychic repetition. These paradoxes are interconnected. Each one is dependent on the others. Conversely, the propositions that they attack also form a group, insofar as these propositions are characterized by their being ordinary theories of memory. For it is a single illusion about the essence of time, a single badly analyzed composite that makes us believe that one, we cannot reconstitute the past with the present, two, we pass gradually from one to the other, three, that they are distinguished by a before and an after, and four, that the work of the mind is carried out by the addition of elements, rather than by changes of level and genuine jumps and the reworking of systems. Totally. I think this is definitely um, where Bergson and Deleuze both kind of share their critique of ontological time, right? Because I think the ontological time would be this very mechanistic way where we see a a, a pass gradually from one to the other where they are distinguished by before and an after and that work um that the work of the mind is carried out by the addition of elements uh rather than genuine jumps and the genuine jumps i think are between the two multiplicities of matter and memory um these are the leaps um because we we have the continuous time but sometimes we jump out of that continuous time or we carve out from continuous time into a mechanistic ontological time which is how we can make kind of quantitative evaluations and assessments which is where science comes from and um i think that's that's my understanding um but i, I really like this last bit it really helps clear up everything that uh, Deleuze was going on about <laughs> in those kind of tricky paragraphs. Tricky. Yeah. Intuition then becomes this, um, like you say, this mechanism of leap. This intuition becomes the awareness of duration as pure duration and pure memory. And all that means is that we have our determined past, the past which has happened to us, the past which makes us and collects us. But we can also move between where we exist currently in that determined past. And we also have this, we have this roll of the dice. We have this Kierkegaard and leap of faith between this one and all the others. And this is something that you also get in Leibniz and Spinoza. This is something that you get in uh, Leibniz's theory of, uh, what's it called? Compatibilism, which is a very, this is exactly it, a very ontological problem. The problem of free will versus determination. Because if we believe in a pure past, a past that has been, then we can only understand our present moment as the determined result of that past. Therefore, being has no free will, it only has time. But this idea of coexistent time, of times, of several durations that not only exist before and behind us, but in front and with us, present with us, contemporaneous, means that we do indeed have options, that we do indeed can leap, can move, can jump between times as it were or times available to us and this is what we mean by the virtual 
actualizable states of being that we can use our own intu intuition to unconsciously understand, to be able to move from one to the other, to make a very leap of being itself. And this is where free will then becomes possible and available to us. Um, or as Sartre says, free will is being able to do what you can with what has been done to you. But I think Bergson just, and Deleuze just make it a bit less of a truism and much more of a genuine method, a genuine system, a philosophical system, nevertheless. Right. Goodness me, it's crazy. Well, just to add on one more thing to that, that's also how evolution has a creative element, right? Because if it were just mechanism, then it isn't entirely clear how there would be any sort of creativity within a mechanistic framework if um, certain inputs always produced the same outputs, right? So there needs to be a differential mm -hmm. element, and Nietzsche gives us that differential, differential element, right? But we also see it very strongly with this idea of duration and creativity, and um, it's genuine freedom not just for uh, humans but also for species evolution and it's it's really interesting it's because you, you can also see that creativity coming out through plants and animals and it's it's not entirely uniquely human but i think bergson would want to say that it is the it is the human that kind of gets to reap those benefits the most of creativity <laughs> mm, mm, absolutely uh, it's, the, it's the mistake of humanism that we try to critique all the time um, with our what we could call panpsychist development what we're describing when we say being in subject is more we're kind of this and like with what has been described here as psychic repetition what we call mind what we call a psychology and we then, and so have all previous scientists, pretty much all the humanists, and I think Bergson and Hegel definitely are uh, victims, not sorry, victims, but perpetrators of this, is that they associate being, they associate spirit, mind, geist, psyche with the human. But I think things that you're telling me that Bergson gets into in Creative Evolution, that this idea of mind and psyche through the panpsychist view that we develop out of Deleuze and Spinoza isn't just a human proposition. It is a proposition for subjectivity, but it means that that subjectivity, the idea that subjectivity, that the subject is, is uh, part and parcel of memory and matter, it's part and parcel of having a psychological experience, having a mind, having a spirit, is not just human, and that this can actually go out into the other kingdoms. And this is what evolution as such is. This is what the creative element is, this element of mind. And although the humanists like to say that this is, this is well, not just the humanists, but the theologians, um, the Christians, um, all kinds of religions that have had a monotheistic interpretation of the human being believe that we are given um, imago Dei, we are built in God's image, and it is this very godliness that gives us aesthetic reason, it's this very divine uh, being that gives us this ability to say that we are special, that we are better than all other creatures. But this really brings us down into the dirt. This very much... Uh, our post-human critiques, but the post-humanism of Deleuze Batari overall, um, something that I think we're going to develop in the uh, in our um, Becoming Animal essay coming up that looks so sick. I'm so glad you started that. Something that we'll be critiquing in there as well, this whole proposition that um, of becoming animal, and in the same way becoming mushroom, becoming plant. <laughs> Somehow all of this talking about the virtual, the past, psychological repetition, and with our added element of post-humanism, which we get out of a thousand plateaus anyway, we're going to get all these different conceptions of science, all these different conceptions of evolution, like you've already presented to us. We're going to be able to use just taking these few paradoxes, reevaluate entire systems of truth, entire systems of thought, entire ideas and frameworks about what constitutes being, what constitutes subjectivity, and so on and so on. Um, yeah i'm happy to continue if you are, <laughs> cool are you, um, we Absolutely. have about 10 more pages so that, that, I, it's not super long but it might take a moment um do you want to keep going or would you like me to read our problem is how can pure recollection take on a psychological existence how will this pure virtual be actualized thus the present makes an appeal according to the requirements of our needs of the present situation we make the leap we place ourselves not simply in the element of the past in general, 
but in a particular region. And that is on a particular level, which in a kind of reminiscence, we assume corresponds to our actual needs. Each level in effect contains the totality of our past, but in a more or less contracted state. And Bergson adds, there are also dominant recollections, like remarkable points, which vary from one level to the other. A foreign word is spoken in my presence. Given the situation, this is not the same thing as wondering what the language in general of which this word is a part could be, or what person once said this word, or a similar one, to me. Depending on the case, I do not leap into the same region of the past. I do not place myself on the same level. I do not appeal to the same essential characteristics. Perhaps I fail. Looking for a recollection, I may place myself on a level that is too contracted, too narrow or on the contrary, too broad and expanded for it. I would then have to start from the beginning again in order to find the correct leap. We must emphasize that this analysis, which seems to have so much psychological finesse, really has quite a different meaning. It is related to our affinity with being, our relationship with being, and to the variety of this relationship. Psychological consciousness has not yet been born. It will be born, but precisely because it has found its proper ontological conditions here. Faced with these extremely difficult texts, the task of the commentator is to multiply these distinctions. Even and above all, when these texts confine themselves to suggesting the distinctions rather than establishing them strictly. First, we must not confuse the appeal to recollection and the recall of the image or its evocation. The appeal to recollection is this jump by which I place myself in the virtual, in the past, in the particular region of the past, at a particular level of contraction. It appears that this appeal expresses the properly ontological dimension of man, or rather, of memory. But our recollection still remains virtual. When on the other hand we speak of evocation, or of this recall of the image, something completely different is involved. Once we have put ourselves on a particular level where recollections lie, then, and only then, do they tend to be actualized. The appeal of the present is such that they no longer have the ineffectiveness, the impassivity that characterize them as pure recollections. They become recollection images, capable of being recalled. They are actualized or embodied. This actualization has all kinds of distinct aspects, stages, and degrees, but through these stages and these degrees, is it the actualization, and it alone, that constitutes psychological consciousness? In any case, Bergsonian revolution is clear. We do not move from the present to the past, from perception to recollection, but from the past to the present, from recollection to perception. Memory, laden with the whole of the past responds to the appeal of the present state by two simultaneous movements, one of translation, by which it moves in its entirety to meet experience, thus contracting more or less, though without dividing, with a view to action, the other of rotation upon itself, by which it turns toward the situation of the moment, presenting to it that side of itself which may prove to be the most useful. Thus, we already have two aspects of actualization here, translation contraction and rotation orientation. Our question is, can this translation contraction be identical with the variable contractions of region and levels of the past that we were discussing earlier? Bergson's context seems to suggest that it is, since he constantly invokes translation contraction with regard to sections of the cone, that is, levels of the past. Many considerations, however, lead us to the conclusion that while there is an obviously a relationship between the two contractions, they are by no means identical. When Bergson speaks of levels or regions of the past, these levels are no less virtual than the past in general. Moreover, each of them contains the whole of the past, but in a more or less contracted state, around certain variable dominant recollections. The extent of the contraction, therefore, expresses the difference between one level and another. On the other hand, when Bergson speaks of translation, it involves a movement that is necessary in the actualization of a recollection taken from a particular level. Here, contraction no longer expresses the ontological difference between two virtual levels, 
but the movement by which a recollection is psychologically actualized at the same time as the level that belongs to them. I'll read a bit more and we can, we can do a little swap tease. It would, in fact, be a mistake to think that in order to be actualized, a recollection must pass through more and more contracted levels in order to approach the present as the supreme point of contraction or the summit or peak of the cone. This would be an untenable interpretation for several reasons. In the metaphor of the cone, even a level that is very contracted, very close to the summit, so long as it is not actualized, displays a genuine difference in kind from the summit, that is, from the present. Furthermore, in order to actualize a recollection, we do not have to change levels. If we had to do this, the operation of memory would be impossible, for each recollection has its own proper level. It is too dismembered or dispersed in broader regions, or too confined and modelled in narrower regions. If we had to pass from one level to another in order to actualize each recollection, each recollection would thus lose its individuality. This is why the movement of translation is a movement by which the recollection is actualized at the same time as its level. There is contraction because recollection becoming image enters into coalescence with the present. It therefore passes through planes of consciousness that put it into effect, but it does not pass through the intermediate levels, which would prevent it from being put into effect. Hence the need to avoid confusing the planes of consciousness through which recollection is actualized and the regions, the sections, or the levels of the past according to which the always virtual state of recollection varies. Hence the need to distinguish intensive ontological contraction, where all the levels coexist virtually, contracted or relaxed, and translative psychological contraction through which each recollection on its own level, however relaxed it is, must pass in order to be actualized and thereby become image. But on the other hand, Bergson says, there is rotation. In its process of actualization, recollection does not confine itself to carrying out this translation that unites it to the present. It also carries out this rotation on itself in order to present its useful facet in this union. Bergson does not clarify the nature of this rotation. We must make hypotheses on the basis of other texts. In the movement of translation is therefore a whole level of the past that is actualized at the same time as a particular recollection. Each level thus finds itself contracted in an undivided representation that is no longer a pure recollection, but is not yet, strictly speaking, an image. This is why Bergson specifies that from this point of view, there is no division at this point. Recollection undoubtedly has its individuality, but how do we become conscious of it? How do we distinguish it in the region that is actualized with it? We begin from this undivided representation that Bergson will call dynamic scheme, where all the recollections in the process of actualization are in a relationship of reciprocal penetration. And we develop in its distinct images that are external to one another that correspond to particular recollection. Here again, Bergson speaks of succession of planes of consciousness. But the movement is no longer that of an undivided con contraction. It is, on the contrary, that of a division, a development, an expansion. Recollection can only be said to be actualized when it has become image. It is then, in fact, that it enters not only into coalescence, but into a kind of circuit with the present, the recollection image referring back to the perception image and vice versa. Hence, the preceding metaphor of rotation which prepares the ground for this launch into the circuit. Would you like me to pick up from here? A lot of words. I could, I could pick up from here too. Yes, please. Okay. Let's try to get through yeah. it because there's not that much <laughs> more left. And, you know, I think the one more thing I want to say before we move on though, is that I did, I did earlier say that I think he was critiquing ontology, but now I'm starting to think that whenever Deleuze is using ontology here, he's referring to the plane of eminence of what is. Um, so he's not, not necessarily saying ontology of in this mechanistic way, but more just like the general like being of everything. <laughs> so I, I think I might have been a little bit off on um, what my interpretation earlier, but we'll, we'll keep going. Um, 
Thus, we have two movements of actualization, one of contraction and one of expansion, so inward and outward. We can clearly see clearly that they correspond closely to the multiple levels of the core, some expanded, some contracted. For what happens in the creature that confines itself to dreaming, since sleep is like a present situation requiring nothing but rest with no interest other than disinterest? It is as if the contraction were missing, as if the extremely expanded relationship of the recollection with the present reproduced the most expanded level of the past itself. Conversely, what would happen in an automaton? It would be as though dispersion were impossible, as though the distinction between images was no longer carried into effect, and the, on the only and only the most contracted levels of the past remained. There is thus a close analogy between the two different levels of the core. Sorry, the levels. Ugh. There is thus a close analogy between the different levels of the cone and the aspects of actualization for each level. It is inevitable that the latter will come to include the former, hence the ambiguity that has already been pointed out. Nevertheless, we must confuse them because the first theme concerns the virtual variations of recollection in itself, the other recollection for us, the actualization of the recollection in the recollection image. What is the framework common to recollection in the process of actualization, the recollection becoming image, and the perception image? This common framework is movement. Thus, it is in the relationship between the image and the movement in the image, way of extending itself in movement, that we must find in the final movement of actualization the recollection need for their actualization, a motor ally. Here again, the ally is double. Sometimes perception is extended naturally in movement. A motor tendency, a motor scheme, carries out a decomposition of the perceived in terms of utility. This movement perception relationship would on its own be sufficient to define a recognition that is purely automatic without the interval of recollection, or if you prefer, an instantaneous memory consisting entirely in motor mechanisms. However, recollections do intervene, for insofar as recollection images resemble actual perceptions, they are necessarily extended into movements that correspond to perception, and they become adopted by it. Let us assume for a moment that a, that a disturbance arises in the movement perception articulation, a mechanical disturbance of the motor schema. Recognition, <laughs> recognition has become impossible, although another type of recognition subsists, as we see in those patients who clearly describe an object that is named to them, but who do not know how to make use of it. Or who correctly speak what is said to them, but no longer know how to speak spontaneously. The patient no longer knows how to orient himself, how to draw, that is, how to decompose an object according to the motor tendencies. His perception only provokes diffuse movements. Nevertheless, the recollections are there. Moreover, they continue to be evoked to be embodied in distinct images, that is, to undergo the translation and rotation that characterize the first movements of actualization. What is lacking, therefore, is the final movement, sorry, the final moment, the final phase, that of action, just as the concomitant movements of perception are disorganized, the recollection image also remains as useful as ineffective as pure recollection, and can no longer extend itself into action. This is the first important fact. There are cases where recollections survive despite psychic or veritable or verbal blindness or deafness. 
Let us move on to the second type of movement perception relationship that defines the conditions of an attentive recognition. It is no longer a matter of movements that extend our perception in order to draw useful effects from it and that decompose the object according to our needs, but of movements that abandon the effect that bring us back to the object in order to restore its detail and completeness. Then the recollection images, which are analogous to present perception, take on a role that is preponderant and no longer merely accessory, regular and no longer accidental. Let us assume that this second kind of movement is disturbed disturbance of the second motor function that is dynamic and no longer mechanical. It is possible for automatic recognition to remain, but what does appear to have disappeared is recollection itself, because such cases are the most frequent that have inspired the traditional conception of aphasia as the disappearance of the recollection stored in the brain. Bergson's whole problem is what has really disappeared? First hypothesis. It is pure um, is it pure recollection? Obviously not, since pure recollection is not psychological in nature and is imperishable. Second hypothesis. Is it the capacity to evoke recollection, that is, to actualize in, in it a recollection image? At times, Bergson does not express himself in this way. Nevertheless, it is more complicated than this, for the two aspects of actualization, translation and rotation, depend on a psychic attitude. The first two, the two types of movement, depend on sensory motoricity <laughs> and the attitude of bodies. Whatever the solidarity and complementary complementarity of these two dimensions, the one cannot completely cancel out the other. When one automatic movement of recognition are affected, mechanical disturbances of sensory motisserie, <laughs> I'm saying that really weird, motoricity, recollection, eh, recollection nevertheless completely retains its psychic actualization. It prevents its normal aspects, but can no longer extend itself in movement the corporeal stage of its actualization having become impossible. When the movements of attentive recognition are affected, dynamic disturbances of sensory motoricity, psychic actualization is undoubtedly more endangered than it in the preceding case, for here the corporeal attitude really is a condition of the metal, mental attitude. Bergson nevertheless maintains that, once again, no recollection is inattentive. There is merely a disturbance of the equilibrium. We must perhaps understand that the two psychic aspects of actualization subsist, but are, as it were, disassociated for want of a corporeal attitude in which they could be inserted and combined. Sometimes then translation contraction would occur but would lack the complementary movement of rotation so that there would be no distinct recollection image, or at least a whole category of recollection images that would seem to have been abolished. Sometimes, on the contrary, rotation would occur, distinct images would form, but they would, det they would be detached from memory and abandon their solidarity with the others. In any case, it is not sufficient to say, according to Bergson, pure recollection being always sorry, pure recollection always preserves itself, must add the illness never abolishes the recollection image as such, but merely impairs a particular aspect of its actualization. Holy fuck, how much more is there? Okay, there's not much left. <laughs> okay. Um these, therefore, are the two, the four aspects of actualization, translation and rotation, which form the properly psychic moments, dynamic movements, the attitudes of the body that is necessary to the stable equilibrium of the two preceding determinations, and finally, mechanical movement. 
the motor scheme that represents the final stage of actualization. All this invokes the adaptation of the past to the present, the utilization of the past in terms of the present, what Bergson calls attention to life. The first movement ensures a point of contact between the past and the present. The past literally moves toward the present in order to find a point of contact or of contraction with it. The second movement endures a transposition, a translation, an expansion of the past in the present. Recollection images restore the distinctions of the past in the present, at least those that are useful. The third movement, the dynamic attitude of the body, ensures the, um, ensures the harmony of the two preceding moments, correcting the one um, correcting the one by the other and pushing them to their limit. The fourth movement, the mechanical movement of the body, ensures the, properly, the proper utility of the whole and its performance in the present. But this utility, this performance, would be nothing if the fourth moment were not connected with the condition that is valid for them all. We have seen that pure recollection was contemporaneous with the present, that it had to be. Recollection in the course of actualizing itself thus tends to be actualized in an image that is itself contemporaneous um, to this present. Now it is obvious that recollection images such as a recollection of the past would be completely useless since it simply results in the doubling the perception image. Recollection must be embodied, but not in terms of its own present with which it is contemporaneous, but in terms of a new present in relation to which is now past. The condition is normally realized by the very nature of the present, which constantly passes by, moving forward and ho hollowing out an interval. This is how, therefore, the fifth aspect of actualization, a kind of displacement by which the past is embodied only in terms of a present that is different from that which it has been. The disturbance corresponding to the last aspect would be paramnesia, in which the recollection of the present would be actualized as such. And we have just like two more paragraphs, or not even a whole paragraph, so let's finish it up. In this way, a psychological unconscious distinct from ontological consciousness is defined. The latter corresponds to recollections that is pure, virtual, and passive and active in itself. The former represents the movement of recollection in the course of actualizing itself. Like Leibniz possibles, recollections try to be try to become embodied. They insert pressure to be admitted to that a full scale of repression originating in the present and an attention to life are, necess are necessary to ward off useless or dangerous recollections. There is no contradiction between the two descriptions of two distinct unconsciousness. Moreover, the whole of matter and memory play between the two with consequences that we shall analyze later. <laughs> Hell of a chapter, right? <laughs> sounds, My brain sounds... is full. <laughs> These are not hamburgers uh, of ideas. We have um, uh, we have ingested just pounds of like of uh, textual meat, uh, and we are constipated uh, with um, <laughs> words. <laughs> Uh, with protein and whey <laughs> fuel human fuel just fucking full of it uh, sorry Joby yeah <laughs> all, all I was going to say was it sounds like that moment after an all you can eat buffet <laughs> right absolutely you still want to eat just... something but you fucking know you can't I need to get my money's worth Yeah, oh, I've only had a plate full oh, the joy songs. I might just quickly 
Because you were sans, exactly. Do you know what? There's sorry, this is a little offbeat, but we're going. With, I like the metaphor we're having here. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what time, but there was a Greco-Roman tradition. I'm sure you probably know this if you've if you've ever watched horrible histories. But at parties, at buffets, at festivals, and you see this sometimes in films with rich with rich people. Oh, um, if when, they, when they become full, they take a feather and they reach their gag and so on and so on and they make themselves sick so that they can continue to eat mm-hmm. they eat until they're full then they evacuate ugh, get it all out and then they continue to eat some more mm-hmm. i feel like um... I, mean... <laughs> yeah, on, I always remember that but i always forget what the uh sort of um genuine uh reason behind that was like i wasn't sure if it what the philosophy towards this fucking food was there i always just was like yeah i guess it's just um it's just a show of um, absolute. Uh, what's the word? Not gluttony. But there's another word. Yeah, gluttony yeah, definitely. Works, but but yeah, just like oh, food. Yeah, no, we don't treat it like food here. Food's exactly, like, it's a luxury. Yeah, it's a. Whereas this to us, for us, we are not um, philosophically luxurious. I, I think we, we can be gluttonous, but we definitely have a need for this. We are definitely full, and rather than eat more and throw up, we want to sit and digest, you know, and we want to make the digestion process a little easier. We want to take our time. We want to sit down. We don't want to go to the park and make ourselves ill. We want to keep everything that we've just eaten, everything that we've just digested, which we can talk about in a moment. Sorry. I, I, listen, this metaphor is so fun. Um <laughs> We're inspired specifically by a comment Mark Fisher makes in Capitalist Realism regarding his uh, A-level students. He says that they require, and he makes this generalization to the British youth, but to youth in general, that we want, because of the ADHD-like way that capitalism has forced us to culturally, psychologically be, the way that capitalism has kind of shaped our subjectivity in terms of its systems, in terms of communication and semiotics, that we want everything quick, fast, and easy, like a McDonald's hamburger. We want education, information, science systems to be processed by our mind um, in a very fast food-like way. Sugary, quick, easy, gratifying in the way that all, most McDonald's foods comes with. Um, um, it's, uh, they're not preservatives, but they're something to make food more digestible. It's a chemical that you add that literally makes this food. You don't have to chew it. You could just swallow it and you wouldn't suffer really many consequences from it other than probably your throat feeling a bit full. Um, mm-hmm. And they say that they want niche uh, like this, to, you know, one of the many poorly, poorly, poorly interpreted philosophers that we have in content of philosophy. They want to do this with Marx. They want to do this with so many figures that we as a culture want things quick and easy because we're mm-hmm. kind of programmed to. Um, but philosophy as such, the the philosophy, the work, the actual, this the substance, the stuff that you can truly gain, the stuff that will truly be nutritional to your mind, the stuff that will allow you to develop real ideas, is not like McDonald's food. It's like street, it's like uh, roadkill, it's like raw meat, it's like, it's the most undigestible stuff ever. It's the stuff that you can't digest that will give you the most nutrition. You know, it's like you, you have to eat your greens. You have to eat your vegetables. Yeah. You have to say the same phrase eight times over again before you can really get the nutritional value over it. You have to chew and chew and chew and chew and chew and chew. Mm. There's a um quote, I think, by, um, what's her face? Judith Butler, which goes something along the lines of, um, you know, when we want, when we demand intelligibility from somebody, when we demand that they tell us a coherent story about where their body was and what they did, um, what we may be preferring is not truth, but the seamlessness of a story. When actually, when somebody breaks down, when they are unable to continue to use language, when what they have to say cannot be covered by the utterances that they could use, when they um, break down intelligibility, when you can't understand them, when you can't recognize who they are, Maybe that where something that you could tentatively call the truth starts to emerge when you can't represent what you have to get across through language. Um, yeah. And I feel like that's a lot like what you were just trying to say here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think Butler gets that from Foucault, right? What he calls parhesia, 
mm-hmm. where you have to speak the truth all the time, but you have to speak it frankly. You have to not care for the way in which you get it across. You have to be as frank and as truthful as possible. And that yeah. means to be re- to be irregardless. Sorry, that's not even a word. To be regardless of persuasion, of mm-hmm. charisma, of rhetoric. To not care about how it sounds, but to only get it across. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, and, and that has all sorts of tricky ethical implications when it comes to, well, who can tell the truth, right? Like, um, who sounds more trustworthy? Who do we, you know, who, like, can, um, truth. for example, can criminals tell the truth, right? Yeah, who's truth? Yeah. What truth? Truths, truths that have been developed from institutions, what Stana calls spooks, the truths mm-hmm. of individuals who have lived in experiences, or the truths mm-hmm. of those that have been uh, esteemed as those capable of higher truth, the scientists, the academics, the elites, and so on and so on. Absolutely. A wonderful thing. A wonderful conversation to have after this crazy, this <laughs> crazy fucking hell. Did you, Jeremy, if, did you, what could you say about what was just read? Do you think there is anything You're that... So fucking evil. You can um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to attempt. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I, could try, I could try back chesting, yeah. but I'm not going to. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, whereof one cannot, thereof one must be silent, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I feel... I, I, and Mao says something similar. Um, no investigation, no right to speak. Yeah. And honestly, I feel like I don't have the the ground to start to say to talk about this chapter like i know what it means mm-hmm. i feel like i can only point towards the confusions that i have right if we're talking about truth is that yeah. very incomprehensible thing that we can't make except as that incomprehensible thing um sorry i've spoken a lot matty is there anything that you would like to <laughs> yeah you would like to say I'll, I'll like, before we try and examine this? i mean honestly just that i I, I can only see the parts where I think I was wrong initially. <laughs> I think I went in assuming that there would be a critique of ontology whenever the ontology of time, because I assumed by ontology that Deleuze would be saying successive, referring to Bergson's mechani- um, critique of mechanism as like successive fixed states, which would be the wrong way of looking at time. Like that'd be only thinking in terms of space. But as I kept reading, I saw some things on the affirmative of ontology and I can only really think the reason for that would be that if we're thinking of ontology of just like as the one, as um, the one that is necessarily multiple. Um, (laughs) And, ah, but even then I I think that like, that's probably still very limiting. It doesn't not, doesn't really say that much so far. uh yeah those last few that those last like five pages i'll be honest were very challenging and i did not get a whole lot from them (laughs) i really like these last couple of pages i think everything leading up to these last two pages was it was every all of these chapters read a lot like the ethics yeah first you lay down the propositions and then you lay down your axioms and then you develop each point one by one in a very geometric way and i mean it's it's the it, it it bears fact that we we never did very much Euclid, Euclidean geometry. We never did very much geometric proofing um, in school and after school. So coming to read these texts in that way, or at least trying to understand them in the way that Spinoza had written the ethics, we're very much like, ha, huh? ha. Huh? <laughs> we can see and sense an unfolding. We know Deleuze um, is a breadcrumb lever. He knows that he likes to show us. Uh, he, said, he always says, our problem is, our question is, and then... He leads us on that path. He shows us all the tools we need to find our answers. Mm-hmm. He shows us all the necessary positions. He shows us development. He shows us critique. And yet, once again, we have all the parts, but we are yet to develop that whole gestalt picture. And I think that's the aim as well for Deleuze, is to always carry you along to these paths, rather than on the path as such, to show you more all the different directions you can yourself take that he finds useful for you to take the things that he's found useful in Bergson that he then wants to inspire in us not just conceptually but effectually to then see where you can go with it he wants us to err uh, to to struggle to not take this all in and go oh yeah no that makes lots of sense but to be like huh what the hell are you talking about say that in a different way say that in an easier way please recollection image what does that even mean 
but definitely um he also wants us to think <laughs> and to think means to not be given the answer not to be spoon fed no. but to be let along to be pointed to passive engagement i don't have enough of it <laughs> i want osmosis i want knowledge osmosis i mm -hmm. want to just be able to just get it all in there i want to just be able to absorb it I just want to wake up one morning and feel well rested. <laughs> like it's all in there. Apparently that is what happens in the recovery period of sleep. All the stuff that you'd learned the day before. And I mean, this applies here to what we mean by the recollection and the recollection of the present. Uh, yeah. In sleep, the very contraction and relaxation, or what we understand psychologically and neurologically as the development and the recovery of the brain, the brain creating new neural pathways and, and mm -hmm. cells. I mean, it's a very rhizomatic image, right? That yeah. we indeed in this moment of sleep concrete form make physical our perception we turn our perception our present experience into the past by actualizing it in the present very mm. very paradoxical but he likes us to think like that it's the, the very fact that our present ours as in the psychological and the ontological the stuff mm -hmm. that makes us up as subjects and the stuff that is extraneous that is non-psychological as such he, he extinct he um, makes this distinction at the beginning that bergsonian unconscious is not like freudian unconscious only yeah. because freudian unconscious is purely psychological it's like the underneath of psychology mm -hmm. whereas bergsonian unconscious is a non-psychological and that's why he prefers the term ontological we're still talking about being but not necessarily in the psychological sense which is a hard thing to distinguish it's something that i wanted to bring up and i stumbled around earlier that when we think psychology we specifically think human psychology we specifically think the human brain and in this example when i'm talking about how in sleep we literally create brain pathways that um, turn our perception into recollection that create for us a sense of the past, whether procedural, episodic, semantic, etc., etc. Right, yeah. yeah. But this isn't necessarily a human psychology anymore. Bergsonian unconscious as a non-psychological principle demands that we remove that, that human-specific element from it, that we actually go and, and use this paradox to think, huh, do mushrooms have this? Do plants have this? And this is what I believe Matt has also been telling us this whole time with, with creative evolution, that this is the creative aspect of evolution is very much this non-psychological principle that also is the very, this very non-psychological principle that we call ontology, that psychology emerges out of. I mean, we emerge out of it necessarily, but so do all other things. So does everything else. I mean, we're just one specific form. We're one specific expression of this very ontological thing that we're calling the virtual the past that we're calling recollection and we're finding out using this language removed of all the human elements so this is what i said earlier again sorry i'm rambling i'm rambling in cognitive psychology this is now the the sort of main social scientific system to examine memory memory as a part of the human experience and this would be for Deleuze and for us definitely a freudian psychology the mistake of real of thinking that the unconscious that cognition is a purely human experience but it was the physiologist Ivan Pavlov that gave to us the beginning of behaviorism, which we realize is not just a human problem, but the problem of animals themselves, with his example of the dogs. And then Skinner developed it with um, pigeons and so on and so on. But Bergson allows us to do that. He returns us to a physiological question, to a question of, well, do mushrooms have an unconscious? Do plants have an unconscious? Yes. Dogs and pigeons seem to, but what about other things? And then suddenly we get into this question of what about objects? And then we get into the pan-psychic realm. What is the recollection of a doll, a bin, a bag? And this is then when we need duration once again. The duration of something in terms of not just the psychological element, how the mind creates itself, how it necessarily actualizes its own recollection. This is what we call memory and this is what we call matter. But how things that we have yet to understand, yet to have the language for perhaps, can also have this element of recollection and this element of duration and this element of memory. It's how we distinguish being from non-being, but it also allows us to open up non-being to the potential of being once again. All the stuff which we regard as objective, as dead, as outside of time, not capable of memory or recollection, it allows us to go, well, actually, maybe we have been too specific. We've been too humanistic. We've been too psychological. Maybe we can 
open up this framework of subjectivity, of being, to much, much more than we had previously established, much more than what the sciences have established as biology, at least. I ran over, sorry. That's okay. Um, <laughs> just, I think we should probably um, start to wrap it up because we're a little bit over an hour and 30 minutes, which is quite long. But I wanted to add on to one point that you made about um, the unconscious of plants and this is a point touched by Bergson specifically in creative evolution. I think on the second chapter, he, Bergson basically says that there are two movements of consciousness, or I guess maybe not two movements of consciousness, but there are two movements of evolution and that would be the unconscious and conscious one. And he attributes unconsciousness to plants, which whenever I read that, felt like a really strange statement because I only really was exposed to that word in a Freudian sense. And, but then upon kind of thinking about it, right, I was like, well, no, we're, we're not talking about um, unconscious in the sense of like, um, more than <laughs> consciousness, right, where we're confusing the more for the less, but like, quite literally, just not conscious. And that <laughs> very strange, I, it makes a lot of sense when it's articulated in that way but it felt really funny to hear it said in that in that way but yeah so there there is an unconscious of plants there is also an unconscious of animals in a sense but it's more of a mechanistic one whereas um, plants have this kind of explosive potential that they get from a chlorophyllic function um, basically storing up solar energy like a miniature explosive is how Bergson says. It's really dope. But um, I think, but anyhow, I think we should wrap it up a little bit. Um, um, but yeah, this has been our reading of chapter three of Bergsonism. Thank you everyone for being here. And yeah, um, I'm going to close off now. <laughs>